Hey, here live today, back in Ferguson, man. Road to podcast, you know, X, D, and then we got a special guest here. Yes, very special guest. And this is my uncle right here. Uh, John will let him speak for himself, but uh, definitely very special guest. Bro, we got a good sponsor right here. Uncle Nerys, you feel me? Uncle Nerys, you feel me? Y'all baby here. Wow, there you go. Good, good drink right here. But wow, I'm wow, open. Let's go ahead and uh, give us a background about yourself. Okay, uh, John Gibson. Hey, audience. Uh, <laughs> nice to be here to support these fellows. Uh, you know, uh, see black men making moves. That's a good thing. So I'm John Gibson, native Washingtonian, uh, for all of you DC folks. Um, you can't be a true native Washingtonian of a certain age and say the DMV. You know, you say the greater Washington metro area, right, right. but for those, the DMV was created by the radio stations to make Maryland and Virginia feel some type of relevancy in the greater Washington metro area, even though I now live up in Marlboro, but I'm a D.C. native, went to D.C. public schools, went to Eastern High School, shout out to Ramblers. Hey, Eastman? Hey, the only high school that matters, no <laughs> offense. <laughs> uh, started out at UDC, then went to University, Maryland University College, um, started in government at USDA. I was a technical fellow while I was at UDC. Then I got a call, hey, you want to work at the U.S. Senate? And I went to go work for um, U.S. Senator Barbara Boxer for California. So a non-California working for the senator, but she gave me an incredible start. Then I got another call, hey, do you want to come back to USDA, but this time as a political appointee for President um, Bill Clinton and Vice President Al Gore. I was working directly for the Secretary of Ag. put on the 1890s task force, which is the task force that oversees the 1890 land grant HBCUs, which a and is one of them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, started work with um, civil rights, fighting on behalf of African-American and uh, indigenous farmers, Hispanic farmers, and that kind of planted the seed to what I do now in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion for global film, streaming, and television at the Motion Picture Association, which is the trade association for the global film, TV, and streaming industry, and our members are, let me see, Disney, Netflix, Paramount, Sony, Universal, and Warner Brothers. Big hit. Oh, I want to say all big hitters. All big hitters. Okay. Nothing, nothing small. Like no, this. no games over here, right? My man is. This is the top of the notch, man. <laughs> so back in 2012, I started a diversity, equity, inclusion program, and that was before. And I think it's important to note that was before um, Oscar So White. It was before Me Too and Times Up. So. We, as a trade association, we weren't responding to hashtags. This was just a, you know, a progression of how we support our member studios. But for me, it was, I mean, it's important. I mean, I'm a black man, grew up late 70s, grew up in the 80s, uh, early 90s, and TV and film were really important to me. Sure. Uh, But I didn't see, at that time, DC was 85% black. Now, right, now, like, pay attention to that. A major city... The capital of the free world was 85% black. Hmm. And in film and TV shows about D.C., I didn't see my community. And I didn't see the diversity within the black American experience. Because we're not a monolith. Hmm. So your story may not be my story, but your story is valid. And it is worthy to be told, just like your story. And that's why we got to get a place where we are start accepting of stories. And so when I got to the MPA... I thought there had to be people that looked like me on these studio lots working towards this. And I found there were a lot of them. I have some incre- incredible friends, colleagues, mentors that are working in the industry every day to get it to a place where there is true gender parity, equity, access, opportunity, that uh, folks like us from marginalized communities, they have a seat at the table. And not just sitting at the table, but they are included in right. the decision making process. And that's happening. You can see it now in all of our streaming. Like we're in a golden age of multiculturalism, but we still have a long way to go. We can't rest, we can't settle. We still have a way to go. So, so my question, oh, right? You gotta take a shot. Oh yeah, we got. I forgot to take, take a shot, take a shot oh, but okay. yeah, because that was a lot of yeah. compliments you yeah. made right there, no, and you just, brushed through it like it was nothing. <laughs> nothing. God took a shot of that. That's all due to my mama's prayers. There you go. Ooh. And and Uncle Nearest. Th- oh, <laughs> listen, Uncle Nearest is <laughs> moved every time. But look, and this oh, this is my thing. So. Cause you named about all like the political moves that you did or whatnot, right? And, and how you mentioned it off and now you're in a position you are now. How can you say like the political roles and what the challenges you faced there kind of like prepares you for that? Because it's for like it's in my world and the outside looking in, it's like two different realms. Mm-hmm. So like, how can you just connect that? 
I mean, it's the power of networking. You know, I grew up in a time where even um, being at Eastern, and I was uh, splitting my time to Eastern, and at the time it was a Chamberlain Vocational School doing business, your teachers were pushing you because, I mean, the federal government is here. It's the largest employer. Get that good government job because it's safe. Always, and there's, yeah. Like, yeah, I was just going to say, like, that's been a, a reoccurring message I heard in the household, yeah. you know, like, oh, we're in D.C., you know, we pay well here, you know, it's stability here, you know, but I always felt like that kind of stripped me of, like, learning who I can potentially be. Absolutely. And look, I know some incredible folks work for the federal government. Again, I got my start there. There's, I mean, the government is constantly involved, and there's some incredible careers there. But if, and particularly for various, whether it be engineering or whatever your your um, your degree is or your specialty specialty, but if you didn't want to work for the government, it was like almost like you were pushed there. And I get it. Educators thought that was this job security. It was yeah. a different time there where you right. would start somewhere, and you would end up, you know, thirty, forty years. You would leave there with a good pension. What times have changed? But that was my start. But I was always aggressive because my mom just believed that seize the moment, take advantage of opportunity. Right. Um, I'm a Interesting enough, I'm a natural introvert, but because of my job, sometimes I've, I, you know, I speak in front of an audience, it could be three to four thousand. But I am an introvert, so I have to push past my own safety net, comfort zone, if you will, uh -huh. to, you know, to engage people. And that's something we have to, we have to learn to do. Um, Question. Yes, sir. How did you um, develop that mindset, though? Because, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, you have to get out your comfort zone, you have to be uncomfortable. And that ain't but, easy. You know, a lot of people aren't good under pressure, you know, and it takes time for you. Uh, just based on my experiences, I think due to trial and error, mm -hmm. I've become more comfortable being uncomfortable because I've been aware now that, well, my back was against the wall before, you know, now I just have to continue to push forward, you know, but I know a lot of people who don't know, you know, well, basically, how do you, what advice would you give to that person? You know, it's a constant state of evolution because even now I have to ask myself that very tough question, are you too comfortable? Mm -hmm. Because when you know something so well, it's almost like second nature and it's, you know, do I need to be a disruptor? Do I need to disrupt my comfortability to get to the next level? And I'm actually in that period right now. Mm -hmm. Because again, uh, with the DNI program, January, it'll be 10 years. Um, it's made, I think, a tremendous act, impact on the industry. I have 50 partners now, from zero to 50, that I manage. And our work is done behind the scenes. So a lot of the things that you're seeing now, I think we and our partners working with our studios have helped make this stuff a reality. Right. But it's, again, like, well, so what's next? What do you want to do next? So I'm in that process now. So I think uh, having those honest conversations with yourself is important. Mm -hmm. You can lie to other people. Yeah. You can present um, your own version of what you want them to think your reality yeah, is, but you cannot lie to yourself. When you are in those quiet times and you are thinking, or when you sometimes when you just look up at the mirror, even if you're in like the bathroom and you catch that glance, mm -hmm. you look at yourself and you're like, yeah, you know, not fraud in the sense of a fraud, but like, like you know, like you you better than this, right? Or am I? living at the best level I can live, or am I give me, or am I scared to do the next thing, the unknown? The unknown is really scary. Absolutely. And, and, and I would say, like, I would feel like in our generation, complacency is an issue with, all, like, all of us, right? We'll feel as though, especially newly college graduates, right? We'll feel like once we have the degree, we literally are entitled to everything. Like, we think that, like, with the bachelors, we have the key to open up everything. We're very complacent of not trying to work for anything because we did so much we kind of went against it went a beat beat the odds and obtained a college degree but it's just like you said you have so many accolades but you're still saying every day is room to like evolve there's room to grow and things of that nature and i feel like this yeah. generation they gotta know that and I, I you know i was hungry and i even remember when i was at um usda and i was um this is before i went to before i went to the hill yeah so i was on that track for that good federal career right and um, I was, you know, sometimes I'm the only black male in the room. Mm -hmm. You got to get past that. Yeah. You know? yeah. And you got to look, um, utilize it for your benefit. Yeah. If you are a, the only any person, utilize it to your benefit. And so I used to go over to our legislative affairs office. And that was outside of the administrative staff. It was predominantly like, no, it was all white. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe all Republican at the time. 
But I engaged with them. I talked with them. They knew I was competent. Um, all of those good things. Mm-hmm. And when the opportunity came up for the Hill to go to um, work for the senator, they helped prepare me. For real. You would be amazed at how people really, if they see that you are motivated, mm-hmm. they will support you. For if sure. you are competent. So, um, I will say my career mm-hmm. advancement, interesting enough, has really benefited from the support of white males. Wow. Let's get into that. Yeah, because I was definitely about to say, like, it's, it, I would say, especially in D.C., it's kind of like uh, a crab or how we always say, like, once you up there, someone pulls you down. I, I can't, I, I won't necessarily uh, classify that to D.C., though, because it's, I just think that specifically our culture, black yeah, people in yeah, itself, for sure, for sure. don't help one another out. And I think the biggest thing is, a lot of that is due to the fact that we have had, um, you know, some circumstances that weren't necessarily like ideal. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people are put in positions that aren't ideal. So, you know, necessarily they more so thinking about themselves, yeah, more so than the uh, community. But you know, I don't, I we, but I think what hindered us though is us not having any like you know counterparts mm-hmm. like from yeah. other races. You know, really in DC it was black Hispanic. That's yeah. all I seen growing and that, up. And that's school. literally what I had to try to tell someone. In oh, Florida. Ethiopian. Like, yeah, like in Florida, you literally had your set group because you had your you had like in the high school you see your flow Caucasian, mm-hmm. you got your blacks, you got Hispanics, and you got Ethiopian, you got the rest. Yeah. You know, the rest is all. Ex- you know, DC is a variety. Yeah, like, right, yeah, right, yeah. DC and then even the Hispanics, they had their designated area of DC, which is like y'all had that, we mm-hmm. got that, and then the blacks, we had our designated area until we get gentrification came, of course. But like I was explaining that in Florida, you got so many different cultures and the black people there because they're so diverse there and they understand that like, they're outnumbered typically because you got so many different races. They just stick together. I don't know how to talk to white people, honestly. Like from a, from a standpoint of like, if I was to ask for something, mm-hmm. even if, even if though, you, even though like, you know, even if it's just something simple, but it's just like, do I do this? Like, I, I've never had the interaction, so I don't necessarily know was you know like the, the rules and, and I you know what I respect your honesty I remember I'm catching a story yeah, yeah, yeah I was um I think maybe right before the yeah, okay. okay. for that yeah there you right. go uh, I think I was probably in junior high okay went to high for all the DC folks before it was high in L when it was just high on Pennsylvania Avenue mm-hmm. now the Harris Teeter but that's a whole nother story <laughs> My mom uh, was a nurse at Capitol Hill Hospital, which is uh, now something else plus condos. And we, I met her for lunch, and she was going to take me to this place, Hogs on the Hill. And we walked in. It was predominantly white. And I got so uncomfortable. I, and I, I really wanted barbecue, but I told her, I want something else. Mm-hmm. And she looked at me. I said, I want something else. And we left out. And as we walking down the street, she said, are you scared of white people? Mm-hmm. I don't know if I was scared if I was just was uncomfortable. Whereas now, I'm sometimes, I'm in only room. Like, my best friend of 25 years, she met, D met him, Tom, is mm-hmm. white, blonde, blonde hair, blue eyes. <laughs> I'm the godfather to his sons. I was in his wedding. We're the same age. His birthday is the day after mine. Uh, even though he was, grew up in New York, between New York and Florida, he was born in D.C. But that is, we years ago, we progressed from being brothers. I mean, uh, friends, so we're brothers. Like, that is right. my homie. Uh, and uh, we've had, as brothers, very uncomfortable conversations about race and perception because there's some things I wanted to know and there's some things he wanted to know. And there's some biases I had, some biases he's had, because we all have them, we have to yeah. talk about. But in talking to white folks, uh, white people, I had to learn. I think it was really, um, again, at USDA, mm-hmm. uh, did that start it? No, it was... Uh, my 11th grade year. So, Eastern and Chamberlain, we, it was 81 interns. We all had to go to HUD. So, it was a big thing you prepared for all year was this HUD internship. Okay. We would be there for two weeks. I got sent to Housing Communications, which is the Communications Department of HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Department. And after the two weeks were over, they said good, good job to every one of them. Only one person got offered to stay out of 81. Me. Yeah. And it was the director of the division, his name is Jim, white male, and was the deputy director. A very strong number two. So she almost kind of ran the division, mm-hmm. Republican. And something that she saw in me, and like she was like became like a mentor. And that was my first time because it was a, a, a office full of professionals, overwhelmingly white. 
the administrative staff were black, black females. I think it was only uh, one black male in the entire office. He was administrative, three administrative uh, black women. And so that threw me into it. Yeah. And I was like, you know, they're just, we really, there's much more that connects all of us and separates us. Amen. Right? And that's what people feel. About we us. focus on what separates. Because like, at the end of the day, everybody wants their children to do better than they did. They want quality health care. They want, you know, I think when people fall in hard times, the government should come in to assist them for a period. We can all agree on that. Uh, on a lot of stuff, we just, we let the minor things blow up. Yeah. But it is, you would find if you had those conversations, and I can certainly help you with that, mm -hmm. off this, that you will find some people that are genuinely supportive and they want to help. Just like, they're all not one way, because they're not a monolith, we're not a monolith, and right. it's just getting to know folks. But that's something I did have to work through. For coming from D.C., yeah, at the is. time, it was overwhelmingly, you know, um, you know, black, and I think sometimes that's the argument of that's why you should yeah. not go to HBCUs because you. But no, that's that's BS. It's absolutely BS. That, and I was going to jump onto that. HBCUs, too. what what they do for us, for this country, for this world, you can't. It cannot be matched. It can't even. It's even sometimes hard to quantify. It is so important because it gives you a foundation. So when you go to a world where sometimes you are the only one in the room. Right. You know you have a support system because you know every experience of being the only one in a room is not a great experience. Right. Sometimes it is. Um, December two thousand nineteen, the NPA we hired uh, our head of digital media, a brother. I was like, this is Christmas for me. I was so <laughs> happy because one, he's the coolest person, and uh, he's now our head of our all of our social media platforms, everything digital media, digital and media. And about um, late March, he I think late March April, he got promoted to VP. So now there are two. Black men VPs at the NPA in Washington. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I sent him a bottle of open ears to say congratulations. <laughs> but I was so happy. It wasn't a, oh my God, I want to be the only one. Sometimes we get in that trap where we want to be the only one because it's a novelty or we think if it's both of y'all, you're going to take away from me and it's yeah. enough room for us to all eat at the table. And, and we just had that conversation too, like how basically we always feel like it's a competition with one another because, okay, we're going for the same position, but again, it's all it's enough money, it's enough opportunity for everybody to help one another just get to that type of uh, that platform. And I feel like that's kind of released straight away. And then I wanted to get back on that HBCU topic, right? So with HBCUs, a lot of people always think that, like you said, it's a hindrance because we're at black people. And I feel like the way I looked at it, right? And some people could look at it like, yeah, you won't understand how to like, you know, communicate with some Caucasians, but however, you get that last like sense of utopia. Of, you like, get to that see is. people like you who are successful. Yes, and, that, and that's the greatest thing. Coming from the neighborhoods and areas like we come from. Yeah. For real. Absolutely. When you seeing black people who are being successful, that was the biggest thing that motivated me because it's like, yo, like, I see somebody right now, turns J. Feel me? That was the first person. Turns J went to A and T. I see him on B T all the time. B T, and then he come back from love. He come back to our school. Like yo, like he went here. Like he made something of himself yeah. here. I was once doing something. You know, um, obviously for A and T, the Greensboro Four, mm -hmm. uh, like legends. Yeah. You know, one of the four is a graduate of Eastern. He's still living. For real, for real. Mm -hmm. And I have found that out because I was Eastern's PTA chair for a while, and then the governor's chair. And I don't know how I was doing searching, and I. Greensboro Four pulled up, and I read, and I was like, "Graduate Eastern High School." The school didn't even know. So That's sometimes great. we don't even know we don't our history. Our but yeah. and TV just gave y'all some history. All right, yeah, let's go into the books, and we want a little bit of D credit. But, uh, but, but, but DC natives and DC graduates of the DC uh, District Columbia Public Schools, or just. DC in general, that's information you should know because Absolutely. I mean the full what they did was transformative and um, sure. legendary. So to see that, so yeah, so it really is, you know, you know, I think you know maybe I'm gonna challenge you all your next podcast, get somebody that does not look like you and have those conversations. I love uh, Emmanuel Ocho, uh, uncomfortable conversations. Like I love that because I think you have to have it. We started this series at uh, MPA, you know, in the virtual space called Unfiltered. Mm -hmm. And I did one with Black Men in Hollywood with Ron Flynn and my boy yeah, Brian Terrell uh, Clark. And we had an honest dialogue of how it is to be three black men in Hollywood. Yeah. And it was unfiltered because you didn't want to be PC about it. Right. Cause that, and that's the thing that we always try to do. Like, yes, like, we, we, we filter everything. Again, I was like, say to protect that too. yourself. Like, you got to protect yourself and protect your brand because at the end of the day, 
working in Hollywood isn't easy, especially when you're black. So you got to protect your brand, but it's sometimes we kind of miss those things that people need to know or understand early because listen to like somebody on TV and they filter it, right? They'll, you'll think like, damn, okay, if I just do just a little bit of what he's doing, maybe I can blow up the next day. And I feel like that's the false perception, but we kind of got to like, I would say like some people who are in that position and if you're high up, kind of come back down to like the little or like the people kind of like still up and coming, kind of give them those roles. Don't, don't, don't forget from once, from once you came from. Um, yeah. I hate when I see celebrities, particularly like uh, recording artists and like they came from tough spaces sure. like us. Mm -hmm. And now that they made it and they say, I hate broke people. <sighs> oh, y'all poor. I can't. That. I hate that. Yeah. It's like. You stab me and you turn because this is the community you came from. Right. And this is the community that overwhelmingly supports you. Yeah, um, young, white, middle class, they buy all your stuff. But when life hits you, and it will hit you, and you're not, let's say you have an episode, whatever the episode may be, and folks are not looking at you in the most positive light, who, what community is always there to support? A lot of people are probably, I think, I think, this is me just personal, are the most forgiving Oh, group definitely. of people yeah, yeah, for sure. in the world. And I think sometimes we are too forgiving. But we take everybody. We take everybody back. So don't say you hate poor people. Because there are a lot of poor people that are aspiring to be anything that the world allows them to be. But I I just, that's like my little tangent. And I was I, I I, I'm sorry. I a quick question. Because um, you mentioned as far as like, you know, three black people in Hollywood. So I know as black people, like we feel the pressure of we are we can't make mistakes, you know. Um, being like in the position that you're in, and you know, the, you know, even at your level, do you still feel that way? Like, oh, if I make a mistake, like, oh, absolutely, know? absolutely, like, absolutely, like, even uh, last year with being, I mean, COVID, I still was able with me and my partners to do thirty four events virtual. Wow, that's a lot. That's yeah. dedication. Um, and I was just like, but I should have been okay if I only did 20. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, last year was extraordinary circumstances. Right. But I still, you still feel I have to do more than that. That pressure, yeah. We all feel it. We have to be twice as good. We still feel it. I think if anything, last year did give us a license to be more honest, particularly in our workspaces. Like, you know, um, because all these companies wanted to have conversations about Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Social justice and injustice. You know, that time it was awesome. And like now, to me, then it was like mask off. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm yeah. tired. Let me tell y'all about the microaggressions that I face. And I feel like that was a good thing about like that whole pandemic situation because we it's really good about getting in. All right, that yeah. Come on, man. Uh, that was a smooth thing, though. I tell you. Now I say like that was probably the best thing about 2020 was just. During the pandemic, I mean, of course, unfortunately, we had to witness, like, the, you know, mass murders of, like, our own people and things of that nature. But the simple fact that now we can, we all are sitting down and witnessing this, and now we can kind of step forward and be like, all right, enough is enough. We can't, now we can't keep throwing pillows over because we're, we're always active and moving and not paying attention to it. When we sat down in our house and we were forced to look at that, yeah. now we know, okay, let's make a change and, and, and let's do things. So, like, how you... And force like all these people trying to do Black Lives Matter things and they just where you like really can come into the fore. I mean, you know, for so move all them to the plate and just really execute and really kind of include that diversity and make them see it from our perspective. I think diversity. it was a reset. Like twenty twenty was a reset for everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Twenty twenty gave you the clarity to really understand who you are and yep. what you want to do Absolutely. within the next ten to fifteen years of your life. Because we were all forced, like you said, to be in the crib, mm -hmm. sit down, sit down think. and think. You know, and I think. What it did as far as like our battle for social justice is, it's already been, you know, prevalent. You know what I'm Definitely. saying? Like everybody sure. knows that black people are mistreated on a consistent basis. Oh, it's, it's not any new news, you know. Yeah. The only thing that was significant about the timing was that you all had to watch. Yeah. Like, now all of you gotta see. You, saw you know, it. like yeah. it, it okay. can't you can't you, you can't, can't hide away it, from yeah, it. You can't disregard it. It's in your face every day. You know? And that man just got twenty two and a half years. You feel me? Mm -hmm. and, and in a way, don't get me wrong, I'm not telling black people to not be happy that he got convicted, but we need more convictions. You know, we can't be satisfied with these, you know... Um, we can't be complacent with just that small Yeah, victory. you know, just, just these small victories because, honestly, prior to 
social media, you know, just imagine what was going on. Yeah, and I think, you know, what last year also showed, and shout out to Stacey Abrams for changing the game, for being cheated yes. out of uh, the governorship, but uh, she was like, she didn't sit back and fold her arms like, I'm done. She's like, I'm going to change the entire landscape. And I think for black people and other marginalized community, we finally realized, I'm going to say finally, the importance of local elections. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Local. That's your, your DAs, your sheriffs, your council members, local, obviously your yeah. men. Like, um, the local stuff. And, like, we got to be vigilant because we look at these voting laws that are changing in states all across the country to try and take us back. We have to be vigilant. So as big as 2020 was, 2022, to me, it has to be big. Absolutely. And I have a question for y'all. You know, to young men, to young black men, as y'all sat and saw all of this stuff unfold, and it was just so reminiscent of, you know, when I've seen, when we all seen footage of the Civil Rights Movie in the 60s, mm-hmm. it was like, oh, it, it, it did look a little scary at times. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, you're seeing, I mean, mass protests in major cities all over. You had an administration that was just blind to this that had no compassion to what we were dealing with, mm-hmm. how did y'all feel? I, well, me personally, right, I feel proud about our culture to an extent because we all ride it together for something positive, you know, trying to make the change. The only thing where I kind of, like, sat back is because we didn't overall have a really, a goal that was set out, really, that was, like, blame. Because we all have all these protests, and, like, granted, the protests are all good, but what's the end goal? Like, what are we trying to accomplish? I feel like we weren't unified. We didn't have a unified attack. I feel like mm-hmm. it was just a lot of people in those regional areas who were leaders. Let's protest. Let's do this, this, and that. But we never, in my opinion, we never came up with a game plan as a community, a black community, black hole, saying, we demand this, we want this, or this is not going to be done. Because I feel like then we could have made a, a change. And even though we did make changes, and I was proud of the mm-hmm. fact that we ride together again. I'm so proud of that, especially in D.C. Um, even like a classmate of our a fellow techite, Joella Roberts, you know, she did yeah, amazing she things in D.C. So I'm definitely proud of that. The only thing, not saying knocking on her about, you know, whatever the case is, my, my main scope. I feel like overall, if we kind of came together, and I'm not the person to like, yeah, that. Right. But granted, that's just how I was thinking about it. If we came together and kind of like dictate what we want and force them to do that, then it's like, okay, now we really changing the game as opposed to like we're damaging stores and things like that. They're going to have insurance, of course, but we're damaging stores and then now we're getting caught up in like, okay, who's really protesting? Who's really going out there for their own personal items or personal needs? And then we got the people who would like to, to throw dirt on it. So they'll mask up and things, breaking the other stuff, and then blame on us. So it make us yeah. make negative. That's my thing. I think, um, honestly, what, what, what that time was for me was like my chance to leave my legacy. Like, that's how I looked at it. Because, you know, um, back in the civil rights times, it meant something to walk with Dr. Martin Luther King. Like, it meant something when you were walking and protesting and you were in solidarity like with mm-hmm. your people. You know, I was out there four days in a row protesting from going from the Miami, we was going to the Capitol, then back down on Constitution Avenue, you know, all kinds of things. And what it did was, you know, I wanted to be out there because I wanted to tell my kids, yo, I stood for something. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. like at the end of the day, even though I might not, you know, everybody has their flaws as a person. Everybody so, has their, you know, mishaps and everything. You know, I'm not human. perfect. We're not yeah, we're yeah, human. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, took a, I took a stand. Right? right. This is not something that I wanted to see happen for my kids. You feel me? Like, I don't want my kids to have to feel the pressure of policing, the, the uncomfortability of being amongst other races. Like, I wanted to feel comfortable. Right. So right. Let, me, let me ask you, because I was also a part of, like, a protest in Florida where, and, like, perspective fairies where we were and whatnot. So when I went there, and, I, and I, of course, I was proud of the moment, just to even, like, just to even say, you know, I even stepped forward with it, and I, you know, stepped out of my comfort zone, came out and mm-hmm. protested and mm-hmm. whatnot. But as I saw in a rally, of course, you would have some people kind of, like, straying off doing anything and kind of, like, aggravating and making the situation worse, right? Where, like... Not saying that like we we don't have to like be uh, you know stand our ground against the police, but like it's a difference when standing your ground and then like aggravating and making it worse for us. Where it's like you throwing stuff and, and it, to me right, aggravating the police and kind of being disruptive. How you feel about like you know, this? How I look at that right. So 
the main thing I feel like people's issues is is they are worrying about what somebody else is doing. Yeah, I got to worry about my role that um, I play in this awesome. in this um, process. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I was out there. I was seeing people hitting the cars, antagonizing the police. Yeah, and yeah, people were telling them to chill, but I can't control them. My focus is on getting you guys to understand. Yo, we are out here. Mm-hmm. We want rights. We want things to change. We're tired of the same thing. And what I'm not gonna lie. I can't be oblivious to the fact they will utilize that. Like uh-huh. that's the footage that was shown in the media. Like they think they slipped. You know, they want to show the footage of, you know, the mishaps and the and the, you know, aggressiveness. Man, we was out there peacefully protesting for four hours. No no nothing. That wasn't put on the news. Right. You know? Well, it, 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 it's it, it's a constant narrative and uh, of putting communities of color, black people. Mm-hmm. In a negative light, Absolutely. and I think that goes into we, gotta stop we have to. And I mean, look, that's part of the whole my industry's push for having more people as producers, um, you know, uh, production managers, mm-hmm. and obviously writers. Because you know, there was just recently. I don't know if you all um, saw the story about in DC, uh, Marlboro Plaza. Mm-hmm. That was once. That was like when that uh, is a uh, high rise in Southeast Washington. I think that's War Seven. Um, overlooks the city at one point like to live there like you were doing it it says um you know affordable housing it has uh, the owner has not taken care of it um they went a stretch with no air, no air conditioning the city finally brought in like metro buses for people to come out how about like heart and stuff no 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 on good road okay yeah. I, know I think i do know and i think um the washington post had did a picture of a woman who was just sharing her story but it was her on her balcony she was, um, I think, uh, either a friend or relative was doing her hair, which was fine. Mm. But all the pictures, you could tell, like, one half of her hair was being cornrowed, right. the other's out. She's looking down. She's hot. And I'm just like, that's the picture? Right. right. Of all. Like, of all. All that we went through, you couldn't have taken a picture of her and her child, even if they were sweat. That's the picture? Like... And sometimes I get tired of like them putting us in that light. It's just all oh, it's, they want. It's, exa- it's know, exhausting. Like they want that's stuff. exhausting. They want. Yeah. And let's and let's talk about like even in the films. So we have to start calling them out. That stuff is when we didn't have to start tweeting. Washington Post, what's up? Like you, we have to. And I and I've seen that on Twitter lately though. Like, yeah. A lot well, of people. I mean, I mean, look, Black Twitter. I mean, Black Twitter has changed everything. Black Twitter is the start mm-hmm. of so many movements. And uh, I mean, you know. Black people set culture for everything around the world. And you know, I, I love the the uh, that the TikTok dancers, the black TikTok influencers took a step back because this is another thing. When I see people do because they'll post like their TikTok on Instagram. You tell you know it's black inspired. Right. Inspired by black Americans, African Americans. Mm-hmm. And then you're doing all this stuff, and then if your page is public and I look at it, and I don't see you engage with any black folks. And I, and I mean beyond just posting up that black box from June of last year because you didn't fully understand what that meant. But every movement, every song you plan is inspired by us. Yeah. I got to tell you, I have a problem with that. And you got so you have a problem. So basically, no, I can't stand it. I, I, mean, I have a problem with that. Yeah. And it goes back to something Paul did y'all said. See, did y'all see the girl on Jimmy Kimmel doing the TikTok dance? Yes. I, I, see, and that's, are you kidding? So me? he got. Under fire, so then he brought back the actor Craig. But that was her moment to say, well, one, a couple of things. That, that's, it's messed up by so many things. And this is, look, I'm going to tell you this. This is like my day job. I'm going to give you guys some advice. Your intellectual property, like this podcast is your intellectual property. Intellectual property, protect it. Your ideas, protect them as much as you protect your phone. Even if you conceive of something, go to the copyright office. You can go online and you can do a filing to protect yourself because we don't protect our ideas and we'll do a nice dance thinking I'm just messing around someone that may not look like us who has all of these followers will then take it and they're monetizing because view views are what drives you know the whole entire operation of it so they're monetizing we have to start protecting our stuff we have to start branding our stuff because we see all of this stuff that we've influenced but we're not taking advantage of it. Yeah, to that. Yeah, and somebody sure. once said, it's ghetto until people that don't look like us do it. 
real. Like all the movements now, long nails, yeah. all that. I mean, I that is so real because if you look at everything, especially with like like Kylie Jenner's or, or all like that whole family, all that, that whole family. Yeah, anything that, that we do family. was ghetto, but they copy, especially like the, the, the braids, all that shit. Yeah, they take like, that. All right. And then they and then I remember we used to call Nabby here, like the black girls used to call Nabby here. And now like, they want, now they want to be out here. And, and now I see them getting a little, what's the little joints that they be getting the edges thingy? The baby hair? Yeah, oh, baby hair. Like, like, oh, Bantu knot. Yeah, oh, yeah Bantu knot. What y'all doing? That. Y'all don't do that. This yeah. is not y'all culture. And, it, and, it, and I think like, definitely we kind of got to step up and kind of like, and enforce that, all right, we're not having shit no more. Like, but I stop. think also, my bad, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I was just going to say, um, we need this. Like yeah. what we doing right now yeah, for sure. is, is informative. Because honestly, prior I feel like the, the thing that hinders us the most is we just honestly don't know. Yeah. We don't know. And yeah. we and that's why I'm telling you something. Asking questions. I don't think we sometimes we put the value in that. Mm-hmm. Asking questions is not a bad thing. It doesn't say, oh my God, you're... There's a lot of things I'm not knowledgeable about. Mm-hmm. There are stuff today, I might hear a word and I'm like, let me go to the dictionary. Like, we, we have, have to throw it. all of that off because a lot of our counterparts, they have an advantage of, you know, I talk to like people in my age group who are, all of them are making really good money. Mm-hmm. Two things that they've all had probably issues with. Not all, but either dealing with taxes or dealing with credit. Correct. Because our parents were just trying to put money, food on the table. Right. So Absolutely. we didn't have the luxury of family dinners where it's how was your day, how was your week, and right. talking about investments and yeah. finances. So you and learn it late in life, trial and error, and then you get a group of folks that, of friends that your expertise is this. Let me have an honest conversation. I'm not good at this. Can you advise me on this? Like when I went to buy my first home, I had a buddy. He told, talked me through it. Mm-hmm. I found that that was a very easy process. Then when I got my second, like it's, but I didn't know it. Right, honestly. And we have to have those honest conversations of we can be vulnerable with each other to get to the next level. Because we all want to win. And I'm going to test on those two, like two points you said that really stood out. So like the first thing, a lot of uh, black family households, we don't sit down at the table talk. And just like you said, we don't have the opportunity to talk about credit things. And so like I always try to force like now, you know, my sister, I'm forcing like, look, Put uh you know your children underneath a credit line mm-hmm. at an early age because once they get to eighteen yep. now they're gonna mm-hmm. have a, a whole authorized entire, yeah authorized they're gonna be authorized you they have like an entire year's worth of good credit so keep your credit up. yeah right. exactly as long as you, and that, but that's gonna be more dedication I love yeah. my I love my kids so like I'm not gonna want to hinder their future because right. of my my like lack of like due diligence yeah. or whatever the case is so at that point once they get to 18 or whatever they can buy a car they can buy whatever they want yeah. and it's a it's easier than what you had to go through and then another thing when you said that like we had to kind of like inform all of our people like all of our peers like if we don't know the thing that we always run into a lot of our peers and maybe this is for our generation and, and of course your generation yeah. women may have faced this some of these peers aren't accepting of that because they'll feel so, okay, you're not like an expert or you're not a professional at this, so I don't need to listen to it. So, like, how do you get those people to, like, kind of just sit there and understand, like, we're, we're telling you this because we care about you, we love you and stuff. It's not because we think we're better than you. Sometimes you got to step out your box. Sometimes it's, we, we get so easily offended. And look, sometimes mm-hmm. uh, it has taken me, um, it's, it's always a work in progress, especially, yeah. like, even if some my program is somebody's like, well, you done all this, but have you considered this? And sometimes you might be like, "Well, I got my receipts." Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. But then it's stepping back and like, look at the spirit that it was being suggested. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They really are coming with good intentions, good and that. And you sometimes I, I'm always a proponent: of step outside your box and look at it from the other perspective. Right. Look at like step out and now look at it, play it out, if you will, and. You know they they ain't mean it that way, yeah. so like we have to sometimes dial down the ready to pounce and be offended. That pride. I think right. Nipsey said something like that. Like black people have to um, change the way we react to being disrespected. Right, yeah. right. We're so used to being on the defense. Sometimes people don't know. Like um, there are some folks. I'm not calling no names, but they're like they were in the social space, social justice space, but now a lot of times they're on the network TV shows. And I'll see somebody who might be white or whatever. They might say something that 
might not be fact based or I would say when I say the word ignorant and not it's not slander. Mm-hmm. Ignorant meaning ignorance meaning you simply just don't know. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you can say there's some stuff I'm ignorant to until I get educated and knowledgeable about. Correct. But they'll make something where it doesn't necessarily come out of bad intention. It's just how folks have been conditioned. Mm-hmm. And I'll see people pounce on them and go in on them on TV so that they shave them on all these other sites and be like, yeah, you did that. You And I'm like, but what's that a teachable moment? Can you teach, do a teachable moment? Some people you can't. Some people are just idiots yeah. and they are just, you know, closed-minded yeah. and yeah. racist or whatever, but could it be a teachable moment? Always look for a teachable moment. And one thing I would say to y'all, you, we had this conversation. I was just about to bring that up too. Not separate from politics. I don't know. We have no time for that one. Because uh, it got a little heated. But it was good back and forth. Is don't feel at 25, 26, 27 yeah. if everything is not going the way you wanted to go. Even though you've gotten your degree you, or you fit, whatever. Don't put that weight on you. Y'all are young. Oh, yeah. You have time. I think I hate the saying... Old dogs can't learn new tricks. Yes, they can. If you truly want to learn, you can. You right. have to condi- It takes work. Right, but don't allow social media to make you all feel that you're not accomplishing anything. And and, and I thought that's, like, that's, 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 that's the just for us. Right. Come on, yeah. yeah. We'll get to that one. I'll I'll more. Yeah. Yeah. I can't have you. I mean, right for there. us to accomplish, like y'all have done, like you got you two, my man behind the camera. Y'all have come through. University, y'all are pride to your alma mater. That should be celebrated. So, guess what? In a couple of years, if you didn't get it, it's okay. Yeah. You have to learn. It's okay because we always present our very best on social media. Yeah. Absolutely. I could take like forty pictures. Well, I'm looking like thicker than I should in that one. Yeah. And I'm, but that's just the way it is. Yeah. And that's and that's how it is. It's it like is. yeah. I like. With social media, it really depicts like, you, like you said, you only post your ones. So you, we only see that. So we feel like we're doing something wrong, and we feel like we're not in the same, like I would say, avenue, the same lane as, and we feel like we're doing something wrong. Especially like if we got, we got these degrees. Like honestly, right? With NT, our engineering, our engineering department, we make job offers, entire offers. Like we just got the scholarship, full ride. Like we announcing it. Oh, I just had an offer. Mm-hmm. I was—I even did the same thing. <laughs> I did the same thing. Yeah, I, 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 we I, all do it. Because I'm a conqueror. I'm saying, oh, it. But, but then, like how you said, though, right? When you're doing that, everybody's seeing your accounts, but they don't understand all the failures that you go through. You know, yeah. and at times you're thinking that, okay, I work harder than the next person. And that's, that's what I became, like, I would say, a prisoner to. Like, I always had that mentality, okay, I work better. I work harder than this person. I'm mm-hmm. getting better grades than that person. Why well, can't get the opportunities? But now yeah. I understand. Like with school, they instill in your mind if you keep becoming a, a yes person, just uh, listen to that per, uh, listen to just one man yeah. or whatever the case is. You'll never go far. And I seen everybody. I seen everybody with these high GPAs wasn't getting the jobs. So like after school, I'm like, what you doing after school? Oh damn, I didn't find nothing. And then I'm like, well, like you know, what I was so proud of you. I mean, not just my nephew. This is yeah. my this is my son. I mean, <laughs> but you like that. But like when you went to um, University of Alabama, Birmingham, you did the uh, internship. When you got offered in Chicago and then you were like, Pops, hey, um, I got this opportunity in L.A. Because I'm always in L.A. because our studios are there. I was like, go to L.A. But that was so life changing for you. For sure. But even like, the, did they, you ever tell them the story of when you had like six college acceptances and... 18, you slightly missed oh, yeah, 18 yeah. and you called me that morning because you didn't feel like was it ACT? Yeah, it was like so basically I got accepted to like other colleges and they accepted me from mechanical engineering and they was giving me some type of bread but not all the bread and I was just like I'm, I'm and then A&T was the only school that was like no, nah, your ACT score is not it you're not getting into the college of engineering but you're going to undecided and I called them I was just like listen, I'm not trying to do this ACT again right. I'm Should- through with this and it's like I and they talking about undeclared, like, who the hell do they think? And I'm just, in my head, I'm just like, who the hell do they think? They so he was like, undeclared? you think I'm good with the other universities? And I was like, if you don't get your ass up and go take that damn test. Because I knew A&T, one, is the school for you. Mm-hmm. But I knew he really wanted to go there. And that's sometimes, I couldn't be, at that case, pacifying him. It's uh, the world is unforgiving yeah. for black people. It's really unforgiving for black men. I be trying to tell people. So that, like, I can't call to you in this moment. I will call to you when you actually need it. Yeah. But in this moment of you going to take and but look what happened. 
Because yeah, I'm about to say. I'm about to say I went there undecided. The next that very next year, I worked my ass off the first year. Then very next year, I was trying to figure out like how I'm gonna get back to school. Cause like my the DC cop, I was being lazy. I forgot about it and get that money. So I'm just like, damn, like how I'm gonna get this money? I was calling up to the school every day. And that's when I officially declared McCann was in there that summer. Then like it was just God, and this was God's work. It was just like, listen, like they like, like I always called a financial office or whatever, trying to see what I can do. At first, I owe money. And then they were just like, oh, you got a refund. I said, what? They said, yeah, you got a, you got a refund check. I said, how the hell I get a refund? I didn't even pay what I owe. They're like, nah, you got a scholarship. Like, they gave you a scholarship. So, at that point, I was on a full ride for the next three years. Yeah. And and, and, and then I had an RA job, 800 a month. And, yeah. I, and I had a house to my, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, because you asked about that. Should I take this? I was like, uh, so we don't have to see your money? Yes. Right. Yeah. But, no, it's, but audience, the thing is... Take these opportunities. You Absolutely. do have some people like if there's some people like in social media of folks, reach out to like I, I I would do all these panels with aspiring filmmakers last year. And I'm like, everybody's home. Reach out to somebody. If somebody that you are a fan of, they might not be an A-lister, reach out because my personal philosophy is it's always a no until you ask. Right, for sure. What do you have to lose? And if they say no, be like, okay. In a couple of months, do it again. Persistency really does win the race. And that, that was going to be my next question. With the filmmakers, like young filmmakers get into the game and things, and then they say like everybody's trying to get into like, I would say that craft or that industry. With like advice early on. So, I want to say just fail you because everybody's not going to jump off and become a uh, Frank. Right. Well, look, I'll give you an example. So you hear from my memorial at Cookout. Mm -hmm. um, my, he's like a doctor brother, Reggie Locard, who graduated from North Carolina Central. Um, he was a track star, but he was passionate about film. We do. He's a New York uh, native and and current resident. And we do this event every year called the New York State Multicultural Creativity Summit. Mm -hmm. So we do this in partnership with the New York Governor's Office, and we pick one of our multicultural partners. Like it could be the New York Latino Film Festival, Urban World Film Festival, the Ghetto Film School. And the first one we did, I invited him. Mm -hmm. He came, took notes, mm -hmm. and after it, it's like a four hour event, and then there's a networking lunch. And, so for all the executives that are there, you ask the audience, you can network with them. He came, second, third. He was like, he did a short film, and then he was like, I'm going to do a feature film, a million dollar budget. He understood, took all the notes, connected with the HBO people. I didn't know HBO gave out grants for emerging filmmakers. He got a grant. Oh, got all this. His film is um, Eight for Alpha, which is it, it's a discussion about gender norms. Because in, a relation, in, the, in, the, in the series, he plays a trainer. Who got laid off. His wife, I believe, is a I think wife or fiance. She's a lawyer. So she's making more money. Mm -hmm. So he's home doing all the cooking and stuff. She's out there, but he didn't want to tell his buddies that mm -hmm. it's switched. Because again, that, that's, 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 that's okay. Right so there. okay, so he's gonna be our next podcast. Reggie, I'm gonna <laughs> hey, yeah, I'm yeah. Reggie, I like that. Reggie, Reggie, Reggie we're talking in, man. We talking but about. it was just great, but he look, uh, I think Shadow on Act did a story about him. I think so much press has done. He they just premiered the other day at the Manhattan Film Festival. Your um, stepdad's um, niece, uh, uh, Lucy's daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Mecca. I got her connected. She was in film. See, it's all about connecting people. Right. She was like, she hit me up. Hey, I'm an actress. I wanna. And I'm like, well, I have a buddy who's an independent filmmaker. I, hey, Reggie, will you talk to her? I didn't even know that grew into her being in his film. Mm, so she was there that night. But all these films, he did the, I think it was the Toronto Black Film oh, Festival. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So it's awesome. like, I think he has 13 film festivals this year. Because he went to an event I invited him to. I'm like, I'll get you in the door. But you got to do the work. Right. And, right. I, and, that's, and that's what I feel like a lot of people lack. I'll yeah. give you the opportunity, but I can't do that work for you. You got to go make your own, build your own legacy, build Absolutely. your own blueprint. But I'll just give you the opportunity to go ahead and showcase it. It's now... All the times that you've been prepping, all the times you've been working behind the scenes, it's time for you to go execute with that. I think, like, just out of everything that I took away from, you know, just this whole, you know, conversation, just that, you know, um, in order to do something special, you got to you gotta do something a little crazy, you know? Yeah. Like, you got to do something that's going to make the world feel yep. you know? Because I feel like we straddle the fence too much. Yeah. Like, I, I just want to, eh, you know, like, and, and I just was having this talk with him, you know, as in regards to film. Like, I, I, I love movies. I wrote some short stories myself, you know, but 
I don't I see like the movies that we had in reference to the wood, Boys in the Hood, Friday, and don't get higher that learning. Yeah. Um uh, uh, class act. It's just like it was a certain feel of black movies, love and basketball that we could relate to for uh, a nostalgic purpose. And I wanted to get back to that point. So I'm gonna say this right this and it, right here and now. Uh-huh. I don't think this is Uncle Nears talking, <laughs> but uh, ABFF because he lives in Fort Lauderdale. He can house y'all. I will give the three of you all in PA passes because what I've been doing the last couple of years, we get a lot of passes, and you know you invite. Friends and family down, but what was happening was I was like, you know what? Let me create something called M- M- MPA Ambassadors. So you get a sponsor's badge, which pre- pretty much gets you into every event. And then I would let them loose. Yeah. And then I would let them feed information back to our. This is before my guy David Hudson came um, back to DC. So it was like you were eyes and ears. So you would do Insta stories and all of this. But it really was for aspiring filmmakers because I felt. Like, yeah, I mean, if somebody I know wants to come down, come down on your own. Mm-hmm. But I really just wanted to help particularly students or recent grads who just could not necessarily afford a badge that gives you access to everything. So, and, 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 that's, that's, hey, and I feel so, like that opportunity alone, this, this you kind of like reaching out for like those selective individuals, you know, who definitely put in the work. It's just financially wasn't in that blessed favor. And I would say thank you for the like, opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank really, you. Just for that. It's for behind the scene. The, um, <laughs> look. <laughs> That's another thing, the behind the scene work. Like people, you know, we that's huge for us. Yeah. And diversifying that. Mm-hmm. Cinematographers, you know, it's, uh, there's so many jobs in our industry that I think every discipline, engineering, marketing, health, all of our industry supports everything. And so one of the things that I want to do with the MPA, and thank, shout out to my CEO, Ambassador Charles Rifkin, who was um, President Obama's first ambassador to, uh, to France, for really, Elevating the, the the program and allowing me to do, I was doing a lot, but allowing me to do more. Right, mm-hmm. and that's the main thing. Like they'll put people, uh, put people, of, people of color in certain positions, but limit it our yeah. assets or limit the things that we trying to do. So even her just giving you that trusting thing, this is like a great thing. That no, he he has been an amazing supporter. He's but, been my positive. No, no, worries. No, he's been an amazing supporter. So yeah, so uh, and that's the thing. And then. Uh, and another thing I just want to touch on before, like, uh, you know, we close things up or whatnot. Um, can let's talk about how just a person, like you said, the behind the scenes person, people, things of that nature, how they kind of get into it and diversity is different. Like, how, how would you say, like, if the behind the scenes person can, like, get into it, what's a good way how they can get into that? Well, I think one of the reasons, I, I'm a huge proponent of film festivals mm-hmm. because so many uh, executives from Hollywood are looking for the next best thing. Uh, I remember... 2013? Is it 2013? Um, late June, I believe it was. I'm trying to get my timeline right because last year felt like five years ago. I swear. <laughs> but it was this little old director, you've seen the picture, mm-hmm. did his first feature film. He came to DC. We had him at the NPA Theater. So, yeah, while all of our studios are in Hollywood, the EPA, like every trade associate for every industry, is headquartered in DC. And so, outside of the theater in the White House, which most people won't see, the MPA Theater is the most exclusive one in the city because we, you know, so we had this guy named Ryan Cook. Y'all know who Ryan Cook yeah. is? That wrote yeah. Black Panther. Of course. Yeah, so, and, I, I, and the crazy thing, I just had a conversation with someone like I was like, when you when you go to a movies with someone who's like understanding the industry stuff, it's different because I went to Black Panther with him, and he's telling me like all the thing, the details about this special director. He's like, oh, well, he grew up in this area, so that's yeah. why. So he Ryan, had that Ryan grew up in Oakland. That's mm-hmm. why. Black Panther that time, that's why Fruitvale Station. But Ryan, when he came to the MPA, he hadn't even, he, at the time, he didn't even own a suit. His wife now, but his then girlfriend, they went and bought a suit. But just like, but seeing where he is now, but Black Panther was only his third film, his only second major studio film. It was Fruitvale Station, MGM for Creed. And shout out to John Glickman at the time. So John Glickman. It's the son of Dan Clickman, who was a U.S. Secretary of Agriculture that I worked for. Mm. And when we left USDA, Dan, Secretary Clickman, went to Aiken Gump, the law firm. I went with him. And Jack Valenti used to, uh, was a legendary figure. He ran the MPA for like 45 years. Mm-hmm. His immediate successor was Dan Glickman, but I was out doing private equity. Uh, okay. And so when Senator Chris Dodd came on board and I got connected to his team to interview, I called Mr. Glickman, like, what do you think about this? And he was like... John, I think you should do it. I'm in Chicago at a board meeting, and I'm sitting right next to Chris Dodd's wife, Jackie. Mm-hmm. Now, so I had to do the interview process, but look how these connections and networks. 
That's why don't burn bridges. I don't care. Absolutely. It can be a horrendous experience. Take the high road. Yeah. Because you just never know. And I know people, it's a big thing now on saying, I done left. I don't want to post on social. You just never know. Everything in life is cyclical. Yeah. And the world is much smaller than what we think. And circles are much smaller. So take the high road. But make your, you know, if you need to leave, leave. But you just never know. And so all of these networks and connections, that's where, that's how I was able to transition from politics to two law firms. I'm not a lawyer. To private equity, other stuff, and now here, right? Because of networks, right? And then, and then, so the Ryan Coogler, so like, let's let's describe. So yeah, Ryan. Yes, yeah, so Ryan was amazing. He came in, um, Senator Dodd was there. Then he, you know, gave his speech. We saw the movie Fruitvale Station, and then he thanked Senator Dodd for the Family Medical Leave Act because his dad had been sick and he was able to endure because of the Family Medical Leave Act. So that just goes to show that you're doing your research, you're doing your homework on every person that's there because you never know. How that stand up? Because you just said thank you for that. This shows that the fact that okay, you did your at least you even did your yeah. homework or you paid close attention to what I did. They I always remember someone like that. Yeah, absolutely. And just like the same thing with the cast of Moonlight before they were destined for the Oscar, I saw I think the trailer hit Facebook um, like late July. People were tagging me. Oh my God, John, this is a film you should do. I hadn't heard of it because it was a independent film. Mm-hmm. Um, Plan B, um, A twenty four, and. Uh, I reached out to I think A24 Films and said hey I want to see it they saw the email from the Motion Picture Association they were like we'll send it to you today so I watched it in my theater before I could even call them now what was going on at that time it was that movie not 12 years it was another movie maybe Django or something and the, the Moonlight just it just crushed everything mm-hmm. the staff the, the studio reached out to me before I could even call them like what did you think it's like, I want to talk to the director now. But two months later, I had the entire cast at the MP Theater. And yeah. I interviewed them. And I would say, like, that's just, that, that entire thing, it can show that having content already prepared and things of that nature, because you never know yeah. who it may reach out to. Mm-hmm. But just like you said, you saw that, call, and then but, you got them out two months later. And, like, let's talk about this. So, like, yeah, Moonlight. Mm-hmm. So, Plan B. Plan B is owned by Brad Pitt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so... <laughs> Brad Pitt, Dee Dee Gardner, and there's another partner. They are. They have been so supportive in providing opportunities for creators of color. Like he did, twelve years of slave. That's right, twelve years. Yeah. So and and, and sidebar, you know, that's our good brother Ray. Yeah, he knows his fight. We for that one. We for that man. one. There we go. I have a twelve years story, my brother, because Fox uh, Fox Searchlight was the distributor. Um, they had a screening here. Alfred Wood was here. Lapita was here. But no one knew who Lapita was. And I was like, um, the Fox Search, like, people flew in from L.A. Of course, I knew them. And I, Alfred Wood, it just reminds me of my mom. And if mm-hmm. you've ever lost your mom at a young age, I was just 29. And my mom passed, transitioned at such a young age, of 54. You have, you, you subconsciously can develop maternal feelings towards older mm-hmm. women. Like moms, whatever. Right? Mm-hmm. And Alfred Woodard just like she's such an incredible actress, one of my favorite actresses. She was there, and I was like, I've got to meet Alfred Woodard. Met her, took a great picture. And they're like, Do you want to meet Lapita? I'm like, No. I went. <laughs> <laughs> See, sometimes you can be in great situations and be foolish. <laughs> I clearly was foolish, but yeah. Uh, but again, Plan B, and like, and talking about film festivals, the previous year, no, that same year. At the American Black Film Festival, I created an event called Trailer Fest. And Trailer Fest was like, as I talked to the staff, it's like, you know, black people want to see previews like everybody else. Like, you had um, CinemaCon, which is the theater owners convention. You had uh, Comic Con, the uh, you know comic book convention, movies. I'm like, black people, we want to know about stuff before mm-hmm. it happens too. Yeah, for sure. And so we created an event. All six of our studios participated. We had a thousand people the first time. But it was the first time that all six of our studios worked together at, for and, one event. And unified. It was yeah. the most unique event in the world. I don't think we nor the festival understood the uniqueness of it. Because mm-hmm. we only did it for a couple of years. But nonetheless, Fox Searchlight was, was at the time under 20th Century Fox, which now Disney owns. Mm-hmm. Uh, they bought... The first five minutes, and the film wasn't even finished, and they bought footage of it. Mm-hmm. 
They both put each other when Brad Pitt is building, I think, like a cabin. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah, like, yeah. So, yeah. shout out to Brad for and his team for providing a space for creators of color. For sure. And, and, that, um, and that's what we need. And that's what we need more. Just, just people were of color to be represented in that film industry because I feel like we are the culture. If you really want to see the true fold of things and how things are really supposed to be done, put us in there. And shout out for like, you know, you have, um, I had to do a, uh, uh, this was a work project. It was like how many streamings, like paid streaming platforms there are that are owned by communities of color. They were like, I thought maybe three of them. They were like 16. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of streaming platforms. And my boy, I want to shout out Kenneth Giffords, the former commissioner of the Newark Film Office who created the Newark International Film Festival. He works with the Tate brothers, Loren Tate and his brother. He's building a production facility with Michael B. Jordan, who's a Newark resident. But Kenneth launched the Vault streaming platform. So it's a platform for emerging artists, paid subscription to be monetized for your creativity. Like, there's so many of that out there. So Mm -hmm. I try to, in my position, try to highlight them. So, hey, shout out to him. And listen... This is a great this is episode. This a great episode. Oh, God. Y'all can't Definitely. take... And it, and it was a lot of gems. Wait, I want to say, I, man, he probably done gave us like a whole book. Right? Honestly. Honestly. I can take a book from this episode. <laughs> this Honestly, is read, to me episode. Honestly, if you really want to catch the... Like, make sure you caught every gem. Go ahead and rewatch this. Man. I'm about to say, y'all better go ahead and rewatch this and you need to go subscribe. Yeah, right? oh, oh, and that's the main thing. Go subscribe to our YouTube as go well. Like, go make sure to go download from every streaming platform. And yes, merch coming soon. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I was gonna have my shirt today, but <laughs> we gonna get we gonna get my shirt. Trust me. Hey, trust me. But look, this road shows is deep. It starts. Hey. John Gibson, thank hey. you again. All right. We all out. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that one, uh...